I've spent the last two and a half or three years listening to Dr. John Deloney on the John Deloney Show, part of the Dave Ramsey Radio Network, as he's dealt with call-in after call-in, life challenge, struggle, and obstacle after obstacle. I first started listening and became absorbed with the way that he approached conversation with audience members. How he'd pause and remind you that that's not how life is supposed to be. Or he was overly sensitive and overly compassionate and great at empathizing with people who called in and were sharing challenges in life that were hard. Over the years, he's become a little bit more harsh and a little bit more blunt, telling people to their face that they messed up or they're not reading the situation, in his opinion, fairly. And I think from all the advice that he's given and all the episodes that I've listened to, I've really grown and I've really appreciated the uh, way that he approaches conversations and the way that he approaches uh, the world and the impact that he has on it. There are a few things that I've taken away. I have a list of seven different things that I've learned from listening to John Deloney over the last two and a half years. These principles and these ideas that it's taken me episode after episode after episode to fully understand or comprehend. I mean, like I said, I was listening originally not for the problems that people were bringing, but for the way that he addressed people, the way that he talked, the way that he communicated these life ideas or these life values that he had developed over the years of struggling with his own challenges, struggling with anxiety, struggling with, with uh, his own mental health obstacles and growing and, uh, you know, and protecting his family throughout some tenuous times in his life and in his career. And I thought I'd bring these together in a list. I thought I'd share them with you, the audience. I'd love to hear, are you a fan of John Deloney? Have you never heard of him before? And what other ideas have you heard kind of stand out that seem to match up with these? I did just get in his uh, third book, Building a Non-Anxious Life. I have read Own Your Past, Change Your Future, and he has a little anxiety pamphlet that I found all very, very valuable. These are extremely approachable, extremely, extremely easy reading books, but they provide you with a lot of insight and a lot of challenge into how to move forward in life, how to reconcile trauma that you've had in the past, and how to uh, redefine what anxiety means for you. Okay. So, the seven things that I've learned from listening to John Deloney for two and a half years. One, pause and take a moment to affirm or reaffirm that life should not have been that way. This is one of those traits that I've heard John Deloney do from episode upon episode. Where someone calls in with the loss of a loved one or a really hard, very tortured childhood, a marriage that's falling apart, and he'll pause. He'll stop them in their tracks before providing a solution or reminding them uh, or asking them another question or reminding them that they have things they need to work on themselves. He'll pause right at the beginning and he'll say, hey, hold right there. No, 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 don't go any farther. I just want to take a moment to acknowledge and let you know that that's not how life was supposed to be. Your dad was supposed to be there. He wasn't supposed to be abusive to you or your mom. A mother shouldn't bury her child moments after he's born or before he's grown up. A husband shouldn't leave and walk out. A wife shouldn't cheat. That's not how, that's not how life was supposed to be. And I'm sorry. And I love the way that he communicates that and takes a moment to pause and acknowledge that hardship and challenge, while it is something we have to face and we have to overcome, it isn't the way that life is oriented. It isn't how it should have been. Your disconnect, your challenge, your struggle with this thing that you're trying to reconcile is a challenge, is a struggle, because it's not how life should have been. The script went off the page, right? The, rail, the, the train went off the tracks, and you're now picking up the pieces. And you do have to pick up those pieces. That is part of it. 
But you can pause and you can look around and you can say, man, that's not how it was supposed to go. So I'm recovering from something that was wrong, that was a hardship, not from a normal, structured, oriented life. And I think that's a really, really valuable and important way that he talks, addresses, and opens the door to commiserating, to empathizing with the people who are sharing and trusting in his advice. The second thing, anxiety is an alarm system. This is something you'll see in how to build a non-anxious life, but he talks about it time and time again, that anxiety is simply an alarm system happening in our body that says that something is not quite right, that our spiritual connection is off place, that our mental health is not good, that the relationships and the people we have around us aren't safe or a safe place to be that we're not satisfied with our job, our career, we haven't communicated effectively what we need from our spouse or from our boss, that something is left unaddressed and our body will react unless we deal with that trauma, move confidently forward, and start designing and building a life that's secure, safe, and stable. It's a very important way to reframe and understand how anxiety works and how it works in ourselves. That it's not something you're diagnosed with and can never be free from. Instead, it's a set of alarms that sometimes ring uh, from past trauma and oftentimes ring in accordance with current events happening or future events that you're predicting. So I've really, really appreciated being able to reframe and understand better the role that anxiety plays in my life, in my spouse's life, and how we can react to it in a responsible manner that it indicates something we need to work on as opposed to a state of being we just have to exist within. Third, choose regret over resentment. This is an area where John Deloney emphasized this as time and time again, around the holidays especially. I really don't want to go to my parents' house for Christmas because they're going to have my brother-in-law there and my brother-in-law is an abusive piece of work. Well, call the family and say... Hey, we're not traveling this year. Hey, if, you know, Bill's going to be there, our family's not going to be. Choose regret over resentment. Resentment is that toxic bubbling pit of tar that grows in your gut as you leave things unsaid. As you let other people determine and take choices in your life that only lead and continually lead to you growing more and more upset, more and more dissatisfied, more and more embittered by the people and the life around you. So, choose regret. Regret is when you make a decision that you think, uh, you know, you might wish that you had done differently. You might wish that you had gone to visit family or called a friend. You might wish that you had a better relationship with your brother-in-law. Or you might wish that you could have invested money in that area. But you made a choice. And that choice is to not do that thing. That choice is to avoid resentment. Don't leave what needs to be said unsaid. Don't do what, don't, don't avoid doing what needs to be done, or else you'll find that you grow embittered to the world around you, and that will poison everything. Family identity. This is one of the original ideas that I heard John Deloney share that really struck with me. Might be the first idea that for me clicked in my brain, and I love the concept of it. When you have a family or you have a unit, a friend group, whatever it is, a group of people that are sharing a common identity, you can set up these values that create the parameter for who you are and who you're going to be. And then people can choose to either be a part of that or they can choose to take themselves out of that picture. This is best applied with a husband and wife and children. You might have a family identity that is related to being people who explore the outdoors. And so you sit down around the table and you communicate this. And you say, we are a family that chooses to go on adventures. We are a family that values spiritual connection. We are a family that values physical fitness. We're a family that loves art. And your little one might pop in and say, we're a family that loves ice cream. And you agree with that. You say, that's absolutely true. We're a family that loves ice cream. But you get to frame this not only around positive traits, but also around things that you can hold other people responsible for. We're a family that tells the truth. We're a family that respects our friends. 
we're a family that doesn't resort to physical violence. And then, if your child comes home and they've punched a kid in class, or they've lied to a teacher or lied to your spouse, you get to sit down and you get to say, hey, man, that's not who we are. That's not what we do. And you've, by making this choice, decided to take yourself out of the picture that is our family. And we want you there. We're not complete without you. But remember, we are a family that doesn't lie. And so when you lie, you're deciding to remove yourself from us. And that comes with decisions. It comes with punishments. It comes with not being able to leave your room or not getting access to your favorite video game for some period of time. But that's not a punishment I'm giving you. That's a choice you made. You've made that decision. And the kids get to take part in that as well. They get to, you know, bring themselves to you and inform you about what they think that you've done. Hey, Dad, we're a family that loves ice cream. And then you get to affirm that. Or, Dad, you didn't tell me the truth. And we're a family that tells the truth. You get to hold each other responsible for the identity that you've defined. I love this concept and I love the idea of ownership that it plays in creating a family unit and in moving forward with shared and committed values. I also love that it shifts the responsibility of actions and the consequences associated with them onto the person that's causing the action. I'm not punishing you for something you've never heard or understood. Instead, by the decisions that you've made, you've taken yourself out of this group, out of the rewards that are associated with being part of this unit. So, choosing, identifying, and living by a family identity is a really important and valuable trait that John Deloney first shared with me. Choose your heart. I don't know that he gets this from somewhere or this is something that he coined himself, but he oftentimes says, life will be hard. You get to choose how it is so. Being overweight, being unhealthy is hard. And working out is hard. You get to choose what hard you live by. Being in debt, being in poverty, living on the goodwill of other people is hard. And being attentive, going to a job, working is hard. You get to choose which version of hard you decide to live by. One gives you ownership and action. One directs your life. The other is something that leaves you more at the whims of experience that feels maybe a little bit easier along the way. For me, it really comes down to the idea of well, being physically fit. There's a lot of value just in that one principle alone. You get to choose what hard you tackle. Yeah, it's hard to wake up and go for a jog. It's hard to, you know, exercise and work out. But it's also really hard and uncomfortable to be fat and overweight and unhealthy. And I get to choose which of those hard things I want to do, which of those things I want to accomplish. And for me, taking ownership over that part of my life is the hard that I would rather pursue. I don't want to live in this other abstract hard that's brought about by avoiding difficult things. But either way, even if you think you're choosing the easiest path, there will be challenge and struggle associated with it. The only thing you get to choose is which of those paths you face. Okay, the other two things that I have. You are choosing not to be with us. So like I was saying in terms of identifying that family trait, that family relationship, that family identity, associated with that is the idea of when you do something outside of that family unit, you are choosing to separate, separate yourself. So for instance, you have the situation where a dad and son are planning to go fishing, but the son lied. And so the dad gets to go to him and he says, listen, I really want you there fishing with me. I really want you hanging out and I, I, I wanted to go on this journey with you. But you're choosing not to go fishing if you don't clean your room. Or you're choosing not to go fishing because you lied. The consequence is associated with the thing that you're removing yourself from. It puts ownership again in the hands of the person making the action or making the decision. And then finally... Only give a few people permission to hurt you. It is really important when you're working online, but also in any set of relationships, whether it's in the office or with your parents. John Deloney talks a lot about who you give permission to speak into your life and that you should consciously identify these people and only give those few people permission to hurt you, but give them full permission. So that, that 
certainly should be your wife, assuming that you're in a safe and responsible relationship. It might be apparent, but oftentimes it also might not be. It will be some best friends, some close relationships, some advisors and uh, spiritual advisors you have in your life. But you should go out of your way to make a note and say, I am giving this person, I'm giving this uh, you know, I'm giving this person a role in my life that allows them to speak into it. That means they have the ability to hurt my feelings. Everyone else doesn't get to do that. They don't get to control how I, you know, how I direct myself, how I emotionally approach the world. They don't get to hurt me because they don't have permission because they haven't been good. They haven't been responsible with that responsibility in the past. They have betrayed or lied or twisted or abused, and so I remove their permission to affect me. It's a really valuable thing to do, and it's hard to do. It's very hard to frame the, the people that you're allowed, uh, that, that you give permission to speak into your life, and the people who don't. But if you're able to do it, and you're able to really purposefully identify it, it's one of those mental tasks where you can listen to someone saying something cruel or unreasonable or neglectful, and you can just go, but they don't have permission to speak in my life. They're a liar. They're deceitful. They're abusive. And so everything they said doesn't need to impact me, right? Or you can have someone like your spouse and you can say, they do have permission, which means I should listen with care to the criticism that they have for, for my life and for what I'm doing. They want the best for me. And I know from past actions that when they give me advice that's hard to take, it really is because they care deeply about who I am and about the role that I play in my own life and in their life as well. And then finally, the last thing that I have is the concept of the idea of writing things down. I've seen this from a lot of different people in a lot of different places, but John Deloney is another one of those that emphasizes writing letters. A letter to your past self, a letter to your present self, a letter to your future. When reconciling or dealing with hard and traumatic things, dealing with childhood trauma or, you know, trauma as a teenager, decisions that you wish you'd made differently, resentment that's growing and bubbling in your soul. He scripts and writes a prescription so often for people to write letters, to document the journey they've been through. Write a letter to 15-year-old you, or in my case, around my mother's death, I need to write a letter to 12-year-old me, talking about her passing and the grief associated with that. I need to write a letter to present day me, talking and forgiving and moving forward. And then I need to write a letter to my future self about who I'm going to be, about the type of person I'm going to become, right? And it's not all to me, it's sometimes to my mom or sometimes to a spouse or a loved one that you lost. I need to write a letter to my mom saying, hey, this is who you're never gonna see me become. It helps orient myself. It matches up very closely with Jordan Peterson and the other professors that came up with a self-authoring program for past, present, and future. How you reconcile and move forward with your life in a purposeful and dignified manner. And writing seems to be a core attribute of self-reflection and of personal growth and of trauma and therapy. So, those are seven or eight things that I've learned from two and a half years of listening to John Deloney. I will continue listening to his podcast and growing all the way. Who knows? Maybe even one day I'll be able to give it a call and have a conversation with him about some of the things I'm facing and struggling with in my own life. Either way, if you're a fan of The John Deloney Show or you're watching this and you've never heard of him before, there is a lot of great valuable information over there on the show with him. And hopefully there's good information here on someone doing something as well. If you made it to this point in the episode, please hit that subscribe button down below. Leave a comment letting me know what you think of this list and what other creators you'd like me to dive into and come to understand a little bit more about. I have Andrew Huberman on the uh, radar, Jordan Peterson on the radar. There's quite a few people out there that have a lot of motivation, a lot of guidance, a lot of wisdom, and I want to tap into and better understand and better reconcile the stuff that they've taught and learn how to develop and grow myself. Part of that process for me is creating lists and articulating and re-articulating the stuff that I've learned from them in a way that allows me to understand it in my own head and in my own brain. So, thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. Whatever you do, though, remember, if you're someone, you're worth doing something for. We'll see you later. Bye.